can't remember the specific verse, but um, Christ said, none is good but God. And I've always taken that to mean something. You know, I, I've, I, for some reason, I've taken that word good, and it, I've always been so thankful that, that God has said that I could say that he is good. You know, I don't, I don't want to take the chance of saying, you know, there's, there's quote unquote good men and good women. Um, but, and I know that's not exactly what they're meaning when they're speaking those words, but I've always found comfort in that particular word because it, it, it meant so much more than what was said. And, and it was such uh, an awesome description of God's character. And the word I'm gonna talk about today is also uh, a description of, of God's character. The word is, and the title of the message is majesty. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about God's majesty, because it really means a whole lot more uh, than what you might initially think. The word majesty occurs 29 times through eight different words in the King James, King James Version. In most of these occasions, the word is used to describe God's splendor. It describes his greatness his magnificence, his excellence, his honor, and his dignity. And all these are just words in the English language. If you look them up, see what they mean. The picture of God's character, who and what he is. The English language as it is today is, is, very, is, is fairly poor as a descriptive language. However, even through these descriptions, we can gain a glimpse the majesty of our God. There are languages that do a better job, but any human language is going to fall short when it comes to describing the, the true majesty of our God. Thankful we have more than just language to allow us to see and understand that power, that splendor, and that excellence of our Father and His Son in heaven. And I would like to do in the time remaining is, is to discuss three points that serve to highlight that majesty and power of our God. In the physical creation, in his interaction with humanity, and in what he reveals that future will hold. It was kind of interesting. Uh, Mr. McLean said he had the perfect song picked out um, to go with this particular split sermon today and and it's almost an outline <laughs> almost an outline <laughs> so to begin if you would turn with me to psalm uh, chapter 8 psalm chapter 8 and we'll begin in verse 1 the director of music, according to Gatith, a psalm of David. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. And you'll notice while I'm talking here, there is a PowerPoint going on different things that bring majesty to God. Thank you, Nathan McLean, by the way. You'll see it in families, you'll see it in children, you'll see it in the pictures that kind of show just how we are in the scheme of things, God's beautiful creation. Don't get too distracted, but it's there, it has a purpose. When I consider verse 3, your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, of human beings that you care for them? You, know, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. And you have made them ruler over the works of your hands. You've put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Very well-known scripture. 
hopefully we don't always read it like I have read it many times, just kind of looking over it, just kind of read through it. Don't really think your way through it. It is a very powerful scripture, and it has a lot to say. If you notice here in this contemplation of the heavens caused David to ask, I mean, when did he formulate this? Was this when he was a shepherd, you know, out watching the sheep? You know, if you've ever been in the desert at night and looked up at the sky, it is awesome. I mean, it is so clear and so beautiful to see all those stars. And you can even see almost the, the, almost the disk of the, of the Milky Way. It's beautiful. And I could see why it would in, inspire David to think these things, because he clearly was a deep thinker. And he would ask, why would God, in view of all that beauty, in view of all those things out there, why would he even take notice of us? I mean, he's got all that glory and all that splendor and all that magnificence out there. How do we even rate? And that we are such an infinitesimally small part of this universe. One little jewel tucked away in a quarter of a medium-sized galaxy away out in the corner in a universe that is seems like infinitely bigger than anything we are. But yet he is willing to put all things under our feet in the near future. So let's take a look at those things, a few of those things that David viewed. Just talk about a little bit about the physical universe and some stuff out there. Sizes and distances involved in outer space are unimaginably vast. I think, I mean, to me it's pretty clear that in the light of we don't have warp drive or able to ship ships through wormholes and we were not intended to conquer space but we certainly can see it our sun is 93 million miles away and the star itself is 865,000 miles in diameter that's big in fact it contains 98 percent of the entire mass of our solar system simply the largest thing in the neighborhood. But yet there are much, much larger things out there, objects. For instance, the largest known star at this time, it's called Canis Majora, and it is approximately 1.74 billion miles in diameter. You wanna know how big that is. If you set that star in the place of our sun, just the outer surface of that star would nearly be the um, out where Saturn is. It's that large, huge, vast. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is, is a decent size at 120,000 light years across. It's not the smallest one in the neighborhood, but when compared to the largest known galaxy at 5 million light years across, it is only a fraction of the size. And what about the universe itself? Science estimates that the observable universe is 13.5 billion light years across. There's an awful lot of millions and an awful lot of billions in there, and I have no idea what that means. Just that it seems almost incomprehensible. And you notice I said observable. That means what we can see, not necessarily all that there is. Mankind tends to do that. Oh, we got a new telescope. Oh, look how much farther we can see. That must be the end. <laughs> and then 10 years later, they find out it wasn't. There was more. But understand these things are all a part of the physical creation. And despite the vast sizes and distance, especially on a human scale, they are subject to the will and whim of our God. And the way in which they and, and the way in which they are evidence of the majesty of God is in the scale and detail in which they exist. I mean, the vast size of these stars, the vast distances of these galaxies, the fantastic power of a black hole, the exquisite beauty of a nebula are on a scale that you can barely comprehend. I mean, we see them in pictures, as you may have seen already flash by. But it, and it, it looks pretty, 
and you look at all those little points of light and realize they're galaxies, billions, was it 200 billion, they estimate, galaxies with an average of 200 billion stars in each galaxy? It's a lot of space. And it's growing still. It's on a scale we can barely comprehend, but we can just comprehend it. And in seeing their majesty and that power on such a grand physical scale can help us to relate, like David, to the majesty and power of our God. And something that it does even more that you'll find in David, that you'll find in Job, who we visit here in a couple minutes, that it does something. I mean, if you look at that conversation in Psalm 8, what is it? Look how humbled David is. And that's something that God's majesty does. It's extremely humbling to see those things. I mean, if you look at the pictures and you look at the creation, you look at the the beautiful trees, the water flowing, the rocks, and know that God created all of that. All the processes that led to the formation of those rocks, the combination of things that make water, that he spoke the word and a planet came into being. I mean, that goes back to the power that he has and his majesty. And it's very humbling. He is still infinitely greater than those things, and because they are still just a tool in his hand. But they are also a testament to his creativity, to his design, to the power and majesty of that great God. I mean, you can just keep coming back to that. Um, turn, if you would, to Isaiah 40, verse 26. Let's look at some other scriptures here. Talk about these things. By the way, I'm reading from the New International Version, if you had noticed a difference there. Verses 22 through 26, Isaiah 40, 22 through 26. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its, its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads him out like a tent to live in. He, he brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them, and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens, who created all these things? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. 200 billion galaxies, 200 billion stars in each. And he knows them all by name. I have trouble keeping two straight. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing about Psalm 19. Let's go back to Psalm. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. You'll recognize this. We have sung it. In the past more, I think, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Isn't that true? I mean, they say pictures are worth a thousand words. You look at the heavens, the glory and majesty of God's creation is a lot more than a thousand words. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. How about one more? Let's go to Psalm 147. Verse 4. 
once again, let's do force four and five. He determines the number of the stars. He calls them each by name. Great is our Lord, mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. So now that we've touched on how the majesty of our God is evidenced in the heavens, let's take a look at an example of how that majesty is, is evidenced in our creator's interaction with man here on earth. You know, I mentioned Job earlier. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Job 36. Verse 22. God is exalted in his power. And this is Elihu speaking here. God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed his ways for him or said, you have done wrong? Remember to extol his work, which people have praised in song. All humanity has seen it. I mean, what he's referring to is creation. Mortals gaze on it from afar. How great is God beyond our understanding? The number of his years is past finding out. He draws up the drops of water, which distill as rain to the streams. The clouds pour down their moisture and abundant showers fall on mankind. I mean, he built, he designed, he implemented that process. Who can understand how he spreads out the clouds, how he thunders from his pavilion? See how he scatters his lightning about him, bathing the depths of the sea. This is the way he governs the nations and provides food in abundance. He fills his hands with lightning and commands it to strike its mark. His thunder announces the coming storm. Even the cattle, the animals know when a storm is coming. You ever notice that? How the forest gets quiet. Chapter 37, we'll continue. At this my heart pounds and leaps from its place. Listen, listen to the roar of his voice, to the rumbling that comes from his mouth. I mean, when God speaks, it's described in the Bible as thunder. He unleashes his lightnings beneath the whole heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. After that comes the sound of his roar. He thunders with his majestic voice. When his voice resounds, he holds nothing back. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. Let's take a moment to think about what Elihu is saying here. He mentions twice that God is great, that is beyond our understanding, and in many, maze, many ways, even with the addition of God's spirit, he is. I mean, even with God's spirit, it's still like looking in a glass darkly. God says that his thoughts are not our thoughts. But yet look and, and how in describing what God does, God gives us, Elihu gives us, I'm sorry, more understanding into that majesty of God. Look at how he cares for his creation. He provides for it. You know, those rain showers, those storms. He says he provides abundant food. He mentions animals that he has provided for us to eat. All these things God has given us. even though we've turned our back on him collectively. He loves what he has made. I mean, no embarrassment intended, but most of you are aware now that our daughter is expecting, and I look forward to that, and I know they're looking forward to that. But can you imagine God? How much he looks forward to Billions, maybe even trillions of children. Every one of them unique. He gives us water and food in abundance. He gives us meat to eat. He governs us by how he uses those things and, and always for what is best for us. I mean, think about when he spoke directly to Job out of the whirlwind. Kind of called him on the carpet and dressed him down a little. Now, you know, as you know the story, Job was doing it pretty well, pretty right prior to this episode. 
else God would not have said what he said about him to Satan in that conversation. But there was a flaw. And God used Satan and Job's three friends to expose this flaw. And then, then he deals with it in a pretty big dramatic way. He, he made a point. I mean, if you just imagine the power and sound of a thunderstorm and combine that with, with that all-encompassing roar of a tornado, that freight train sound. Throw in a little sideways rain and hail and some flying debris and the constant flashing of lightning, the accompanying crash of the thunder. Then on top of that, this rolling thunder of the very voice of God above and beyond all the rest of what was going on. And what was the end result of that? Wasn't that a humbling experience as well? Once again, God revealed himself through that power. He revealed a little tiny thread of his majesty. And what did it end up resulting in? Humility. God's majesty is truly connected directly to humility. Because that's what it provokes in us when we see that. That every day. With Job's repentance, God rewarded him openly with more children and even greater riches. So you see that our God is a God who deals with man with excellence and honor. And that goes directly, I'm sorry, back to his majesty. And just as we saw with David, the humility that was inspired through his contemplation in the heavens and the creation in outer space, so Job too is humbled by the majesty before him through the physical items like that storm and that wind. <laughs> Even the questions that God lays before him. Who is this who darkens my counsel? I don't ever want God to ask me that question. If it's okay, <laughs> I'd rather not. Things that Job did not understand, you know. The Lord lays before him questions of things that, that have to do with the creation of its world and its operations. And what kind of answer did Job have for that? I mean, he didn't even understand those things. He probably didn't even know some of them existed. And even though we have a much better knowledge of some of that stuff, we don't understand all those processes. God, through his word, has given us a window to see the splendor, the greatness, the magnificence of himself through the way he uses these pieces of creation, the wind, the rain, the thunder, the tornado, all to benefit us, to bring us closer to him, to gain a greater understanding of this awesome God who dwells in heaven. They are tools in his hand, and they're there to perfect us, astound us, and humble us. For a third point, if you would turn in your Bibles to Revelation 21. We'll examine the majesty of our God through what he shows that future to hold. Revelation 21. Let's kind of skip through, down through here, starting with verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's pretty awesome. God is bringing universe headquarters to a remade, completely remade earth. 
In the process that leads up to that, he's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's not going to be any more death. There's not going to be mourning or crying or pain. All that. All the evil that caused that. It's all gone. There's not going to be anything left but good stuff. He was seated on the throne and said, I'm making everything new. He said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Who said that? God said that. That these words are trustworthy and true. Is there any doubt that they're going to happen? He says, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Skip down to verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the, lamp is it, and the, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. I mean, if you read in other areas here, it talks about each gate being made of pearl. It talks about all kinds of precious stones being embedded in the walls. And it talks about um, gold so pure that it's like glass. I mean, that's pretty awesome. And you see every evidence of God's majesty in that picture. I mean, this is what <laughs> this is what eternity will be like. Because that city's going to be there forever. I mean, this is a pic picture of a future without end. A description, as I said, of universe headquarters. I mean, there's no father as the, there's no father. <laughs> there's no temple as the father and the lamb are its temple. We will come directly to God to worship. It's not going to be any need for light because God's glory will light everything. I mean, there's not going to be any night. There's not going to be any closing of the gate. There's no need for rest, no need for security. All the glory and honor of all the children of God will be brought to it. Finally and forever, the full majesty and regal splendor of the supreme rule of this universe will no longer remain hidden to our eyes. He will be fully and completely revealed to us. And all that majesty, the excellence, that dignity, that honor of our Father in heaven the splendor and magnificence of our elder brother will be in full view. No longer will we need to see in the glass darkly because all will be revealed. The picture that God reveals to us here of all those precious metals, the beautiful jewels, you know, the immense size of that city if you look at the distances involved. You know, what an awesome display of splendor and magnificence. Truly a city designed and built to reflect the qualities and characteristics of its occupants. A city and a time that we have to look forward to in which God's majesty will be fully revealed to all forever. Now our purpose today was to see how the majesty of our God is revealed in us in tiny, to us in tiny amounts through this physical creation that we live in. Through the sun, the stars, the galaxies, the vast and varied pieces of creation that God has placed throughout this universe. According to his will and his purpose for use. And we've seen how God reveals his majesty to us through his interaction with man. How he is Lord of all that he has created. The wind and rain ceasing at his word. The great animals yielding to his command. All submitting to his will. All with the potential of being used to bring us closer to him. That's what it's for. A constant daily reminder, humbling reminder, 
of who he is and of what we are and where we're going. We've seen how God reveals, well, and finally how God reveals his majesty to us through a fabulous picture of the future when no longer will we be limited to seeing just a shadow of his glory or a thread of his majesty, but we'll see the majesty of, his, of our father and his son fully revealed face to face. And there will be no doubt then when we stand at a city of finely worked gold so pure that it shines like glass. A city built on foundation of precious jewels, rubies, sapphires, diamonds. A city of the gates of pure, pure, pure pearl. But beyond this, a city that is illuminated not by any fire or any light, but by the combined glory of the Father and the Son. Both of them robed in dignity and honor and in excellence. Both of them robed in magnificence and absolute splendor and majesty. Let's conclude with one scripture here. Let's go to Jude, chapter 1. Verse 24. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.